Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Bioprocess Design and Operation, Enhanced Bioreactor Observability and Process Guidance. My name is Andrew Jordan, and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Now, today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using that chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future download. And at this point, I would like to thank Bend Research, who helped develop the content for this presentation. For more than 35 years, Bend Research has worked with clients to create value by advancing new medicines that improve human health and to solve their most difficult scientific and technical problems. This, this success is based on the company's ability to develop, advance, and commercialize pharmaceutical technologies, which grow from a solid base of scientific and engineering fundamental understanding. Bend Research is a leader in novel formulations, including STDs and hot melt extrusions, as well as controlled release inhalation and biotherapeutics technologies. In addition to the bioprocessing technologies that will be discussed in today's webinar, Bend Research also has expertise in formatting peptides and proteins for inhalation applications, improved reconstitution, and increased stability. Bend Research, now part of Capsip Gel's Dosage Form Solutions Business Unit, has access to additional technologies, R&D capabilities, and global manufacturing infrastructure for the advancement of client compounds from concept through clinical to commercial manufacture. Bend Research has more than 250 employees based in four state-of-the-art facilities in Bend, Oregon, in the U.S., and is part of the global Capsigel network of 3,100 employees. And now, without further ado, I would like to pass the mic over to David Lyon, Senior VP of Research at Bend Research, who will be your moderator for today with some further introductions. David. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning and welcome to this webinar that is sponsored by uh, Bend Research and Capsigel. Uh, as noted, it's a, a webinar on bioprocess design and operation. Uh, this will be the first of two webinars focused on bioprocess design and operation. The second one will be coming up in uh, future months, so please uh, keep an eye on our website and uh, we'll, we will advise when that's going to happen. Uh, our speakers today are Dr. Clint Pepper and uh, Dr. Jeff Bright, uh, both directors at Bend Research. Uh, Clint is one of the leads on the advancement of the modular automated sampling technology, the MASP platform, which enables optimized sampling of media, cell, and product information across numerous scales and bioreactors with hands-off contamination-free sampling, automated sampling schedule, scheduling, and automated at-line analysis. Uh, Clint received his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Washington State University and master's and PhD degrees in chemical engineering from UCLA. Uh, prior to joining Bend Research a couple of years ago, he spent 20 years in the biopharm and medical device industries working for such companies as Zoma, Sky Pharma, and Emcon Medical Technologies. Our second speaker today will be Jeff Bright. He's also a director where he works in the fields of biotherapeutic drug development, inhalation drug delivery, and formulation technologies. He's been with us at Bend Research for seven years. Uh, Jeff earned his PhD in pharmacology from the University of South Alabama while working in the Center for Lung Biology. His doctoral work focused on defining genetic and molecular signaling processes involved in pulmonary disease. Uh, Jeff performed his postdoctoral work at Roche Pharmaceuticals in Palo Alto, California, where he researched the genetics of complex disease states. So without further ado, I'll introduce Clint, and he'll start talking about the MAST platform. Hi, everyone. I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about our uh, modular automated sampling technology platform and how we are using that in our own laboratories. 
Uh, we were originally brought on board with, uh, with uh, some of our clients to help them solve an auto sampling problem several years ago. And they've been trying to drive toward at line or uh, sampling. And we were asked to help them design a, a system that resolves some of the issues like frequent contaminations or sample lines getting plugged and things like that. So we developed the mass platform. And this really implements, uh, you can really implement process analytical technologies that you can use to provide a better process understanding and eventually enable process control. Um, the system um, increases uh, sampling and analytical testing consistency and reduces manual labor. So, you know, we, we hear a lot from our clients about what they need. And there's been a lot of focus now about really understanding your product quality attributes. And we believe that that's a function of two uh, key points. One is the bioreactor uh, processing parameters. It's pH, temperature, the, uh, the uh, nutrients you feed it. But it's also a factor of the cell state and the, and the cell population. And if you want to really uh, develop a fundamental, if you can develop a fundamental understanding of what's happening inside the bioreactor, then you can consistently achieve your desired product quality attributes. So first I want to give you a, an overview of the mass platform um, and you know, go through its uh, components. So first, uh, we wanted to make a, a system that could be utilized at, at all scales, that from the bench, the pilot scale, could work with single-use reactors, and also could be used in downstream applications. So working with our clients, we developed initially the, uh, the SP100 sample pilot, which was designed for fixed tanks, stainless steel reactors that get steamed in place. And after the success with that program, we, we uh, created the sample pilot SP200, which is really focused on bench scale reactors, single use reactors, and has been used in downstream applications. This, uh, these sample pilots are specifically designed to, uh, to pull uh, samples into a sterile area and push those samples to their destinations. And then, and then sanitize themselves afterwards and clean themselves and dry themselves out. That reduces a lot of the issues that occur with, uh, with other sampling systems. But once you pull these samples, we have to route them to where they need to go. So we've developed a navigation system, kind of like a traffic cop, which routes the samples to the various destinations. And we worked with a company such as Gilson, that would make a liquid handler that can take those samples and process them or our own uh, beta prototype cell removal system to generate cell-free samples. You can collect the samples from a bunch of reactors, either uh, make cell-free solutions or process the samples, and then you can move on to doing at-line analysis uh, through using a, a, a cell counter such as the NOVA or something like a, a UPLC. That's the main overall concept, um, and I wanted to, um, you know, it has, it has some functional advantages and some strategic value. Um, the functional advantages are pretty obvious. You have hands-off uh, contamination pre-sampling. It's, it's more consistent, it's a closed system. The strategic value is that you can now monitor your product quality attributes in real time and increase the observability of your upstream and downstream processes, ultimately allowing for you to implement control schemes. So I wanted to uh, kind of show this uh, uh, example of how this would work. You have your typical bioreactor uh, where you're, uh, do, you have online probes. Uh, you're fully able to pull your pH and your temperature. Uh, but now with the mass system, you're able to also pull out uh, liquid samples, which allow you to, uh, to get additional information, such as uh, monitoring the nutrients online um, and taking that data and pulling it into models, understanding the, uh, the you know, forecasting what the nutrient demand will be in the future based on what the nutrients are now and, and, the, and the cell density. Uh, and understanding this and utilizing um, uh, control logic can ultimately get to a feed forward uh, type control system where you can, uh, you can control your product quality attributes in, in uh, near real time. And that's what we're doing in, in our lab, and Jeff will talk about more later. Uh, we have set up a, a, a series of bioreactors where 
along with the bioreactor systems, we also have outfitted them all with, with mass auto sampling systems that send the samples to uh, various analytical devices um, and uh, NOAFLEX and the, the Gilson Auto Sampler and others. And then the benefit here is you're going to generate a lot of data, and as Jeff will talk about, you're able to process that data and, uh, and make it easy to visualize and ultimately giving you the information you need in a much uh, more rapid fashion. So I'm going to go over some, exam uh, some example applications that we have uh, uh, with, uh, either in-house or with our, with our clients. Um, so the first one is something that's happening here and is, is the, uh, the next webinar that's coming up is, the, is, is uh, what that webinar is focused on, is using the mass system in a perfusion a step response experiment. Here uh, the, we make step changes to the inputs in a perfusion experiment. And where this can happen at any time, you can schedule high frequency mass samples to pull lots of samples right when you need them to understand the dynamics of what's happening inside the cell culture. Another application that we have used frequently is a connection to the NOVA BioProfile Flex. This uses a, uh, a external auto sample function of the NOVA where we can slide a sample cell up into position, allowing you to use your system for manual sampling, but when you want to take an automated sample, you can leave this in place and it will automatically communicate with the NOVA and uh, pull samples as required. <clears throat> Another example application is sending cell-free samples to a UPLC uh, and doing automated uh, outline analysis using the UPLC method. In this approach, the mass automatically collects sample and sends it to the our beta prototype cell removal system. The cell removal system automatically produces a selfie supernate with a high protein recovery, and we've seen some clients with a 80 to 90 percent protein recovery. And then this, uh, the cell removal system sends a supernate to the Gilson, which this Gilson um, can then forward the sample on to the UPLC. Uh, it's uh, using a process that it routinely uses. It. We didn't have to develop that. In this case, it's possible that the Gilson can perform some sample processing activities, such as protein A processing or solid phase extraction or other processes, before you send the sample to the UPLC. And I have a, I have a diagram of how this would work. Um, for example, our mass system queries the cell removal system and the Gilson to make sure they're ready to receive the samples. And we pull the sample from the SP200s. Say there's eight reactors that are take, we're taking samples from. Those samples are navigated to the cell removal system. And the cell removal system collects the sample and removes the, uh, creates a cell-free supernatant. And then that sample is sent to the Gilson. And on the Gilson, you can do lots of, uh, pre, like I said, pre-processing. You can do a solid phase extraction or protein A. And then this sample then can be forwarded on to the UPLC. Another example application is, uh, is using the mass system to educate other instruments, uh, such as a Raman or, or dielectric spectroscopy. In this particular case, um, we have a lot of experience with dielectric spectroscopy. And one of the things that happens frequently is in the, at the end of the stationary phase and the death phase, the, uh, the bio volume, say, measured manually by a CDX or NOVA, uh, deviates from the, uh, from the bio volume uh, predicted by the dielectric spectroscopy unit. Um, and understanding the fundamentals um, here of, of what happens with dielectric spectroscopy, especially during cell death, um, and taking lots of mass samples, we were able to make a correction so that the dielectric spectroscopy measurement was uh, uh, corrected and predicted the accurate bio volumes. There's another example that, that we have used where the mass system collects a sample, <coughs> sends a sample to a bioanalyzer, for example, uh, determining glucose. And, the, and we use the feed-forward control logic, knowing the, the cell density as well as the glucose value, and using that to control a glucose feed pump to maintain the glucose level at the uh, optimal level. Uh, 
So I wanted to show you some data that we have from these systems. Um, so first, uh, initially, uh, we did some work at Pfizer where we uh, used the SP100 in 130 and 500 liter uh, production reactors. And the goal here was to compare manual samples versus the mass samples to the NOVA bio profile flags. As you can see, uh, the viable cell density and the viability for the, uh, the mass samples uh, that were collected manually are blue and the mass samples are red. You can see they're virtually identical. We also did a lot of work after, after uh, designing the SP100. We created the SP200 product and now with that system we have done uh, dozens of successful runs over thousands of samples at, at client and facilities and at our facilities. We have been able to sample cell mass. We concentrated cells to over 40% solids and were able to sample all night with very concentrated cell density. Uh, we've been able to run media runs for, for extended periods. Um, the nice thing about this technology is that we're able to send samples much farther than other sampling uh, devices. We can send samples for cell culture up to 70 feet. Uh, we recently did a project where we sent a microbial culture about 80 feet. Uh, and so uh, we made a lot of advances in the SP200 um, and the, the next steps are we're going to be finalizing the commercial design of the product this year. So here's some data from our laboratory uh, where we're comparing the mast and the manual samples both to the NOVA BioProfile Flex. And you can see the viable cell density, viability, the pH and the CO2 are, are virtually identical. Also, the metabolites, glutamine, glucose, glutamate, and lactate are all very similar, as well as the salts, ammonium, sodium, potassium, and calcium were virtually identical as well. So we really did design this as a modular system, uh, knowing that, that different people would need it in different applic applications. So uh, the system can start out as simple as sending one sample to one destination, but can be, uh, can modules can be added to make it to sample eight samples to four destinations. Let me show you how we do that. Uh, the initial uh, MAST core product has a, a computer with, it has your uh, human machine interface or GUI interface, uh, your scheduler, and that talks to an Alan Bradley based controller that can operate one sample pilot and, uh, and one destination, such as the Gilson or Nova. And we designed it specifically to be able to start this way, and then by adding different modules, where you can add a navigator controller, you can now add up to four sample pilots and one navigator device. Uh, and this is easily expandable out to eight. So right now, the system has a capability of sampling eight uh, reactors at a time and sending the sample to one location. And that's either the, uh, the uh, Gilson or the Nova. Uh, these are things that we have done uh, very frequently with, with our, in our own labs with several clients. We had some other projects, and, and we, have the, uh, we have a lot of engineering resource to work on other projects that might fit your needs if you have a specific analytical device. Like we work with Waters uh, for the UPLC and we've, we've worked with Agilent on a, a UV Viz system. Uh, we can add this analytical controller module and the cell removal module to create samples and, uh, and develop the communication interface. Uh, for example, we've been working with Roche recently on their BioHT and the, and the high res Yeah, the mass control system, uh, I wanted to show you some screenshots of that. This system has uh, availability, availability, the ability to schedule samples, uh, con control the flow of samples from reactors to destinations, and it can control information to lots of the devices. Uh, when we send samples to the NOVA, for example, we send information um, such as the experiment number, the sample ID number, and other, fact, uh, other parameters that the, the NOVA needs. So we send information to analyzers, auto samplers, the cell removal system, 
And we have designed this with an open with an open platform SQL database so we could retrieve data back from these analyzers if we want to. Mass control system displays your process information and it has a capability of, uh, of doing feedback control. So here's your uh, a screenshot of your mass interface. So this is um, can control you see up to eight bioreactors. Uh, and it displays lots of information where you have your samples on the top bar, your samples that are, are yet to be taken, and from what sample pilot. And the bottom bar gives you what the destinations and what samples uh, that, that were taken. We have a, a scheduler program. It's very similar to Outlook where you can click on a, on a time and open up a, a sampling event and then schedule uh, multiple samples so in, in a few quick steps. You can set up several weeks for the samples in five, ten minutes. And then uh, we have, there are several other screens, but we also, just to show you, we have a uh, historian <coughs> screen where all the data collected from any sample pilot is, is maintained as far as sample times and, and sample ID numbers and, and the destinations the samples went to. So you know what's out there. Uh, we have uh, six, seven companies that are currently using the MASS system, and those are in nine different facilities. We have uh, 12 SP200s deployed currently, and seven SP100s. And uh, recently, in the, in the last part of last year, we installed three new MASS systems uh, in different facilities. So you know, overall, there's been thousands of mass samples taken now. Well, we've demonstrated ability to retain bioreactor sterility. We use the system in cell culture, microbial, and downstream applications. And there are tens of thousands of cycles in ongoing robustness testing. So you know, how do we get started? The, the most straightforward way is to start with a very basic system where you can sample from one reactor and send to one location. And we can easily expand that to multiple reactors. And if you have a special need, special identical device that you want to connect to, uh, communicate with, we, uh, we have the engineering resource to pull those uh, projects together and combine the mass product with a development program. Great. Well, thanks, Clint. This is Jeff Bright talking. And so for the remainder of the webinar, we'll be discussing applications of the MASS system within a, a laboratory setting, how we're using it at Better Research to really advance our agendas around process development for biotherapeutic uh, optimization, especially around critical quality attributes and critical process parameters of importance, and how we can actually use MASS to interrogate samples in real time um, using frequent frequent drawing out of a bioreactor. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a schematic of our integrated lab environment we have here at Ben Research. This came into fruition last last spring. This is purely a concept. What we decided we wanted out of a lab setting was really to have uh, bioreactor hardware <clears throat> for performing cell culture experiments in novel ways. And to actually do that, we assumed we would need integrated technology and PAT around dielectric, dielectric spectroscopy, <clears throat> NovaFlex, CDEX, a fraction collector, as well as LC technology for amino acid analysis or glycoform analysis. As well, we knew we need, would need to aggregate and curate these data sets we generate using PAT. So we incorporated the Django server system here at Ben to actually again, uh, accumulating high-density data sets using this PAT. At the same time, in order to facilitate modeling and visualization of the data we were generating, we created a software package we call Jubal for in-house use to actually um, look at our data in real time and make quick decisions around bioreactor processes using that Jubal system. So what we actually developed here, Ben, was an integrated lab infrastructure to support bioprocess understanding and optimization. What we sought to do was really make an integration around bioreactors, the MAST system, PAT technologies, software technologies, such as Jubal, 
at the same time, we wanted to leverage expertise around data management and modeling for predictive forecasting and bioreactor operations. So ultimately, we could begin developing uh, predictive models around processes and bioreactors. We understand that at the end of the day, in order to uh, generate value for the data sets we're generating using mass, we need to then apply that, that know-how and understanding back into an optimized process for bioreactors and biomanufacturing. So the first part of the next discussion will be around the laboratory itself, which I just highlighted. And essentially what we actually created is a, uh, a snapshot here in the upper left-hand corner. This is our demonstration lab, lab we have here in Bend, Oregon. In the upper left-hand corner, we see a photograph of the, of the lab, which contains probably James Reactors, uh, Nova Flex, uh, CDEX, LC technology. We've also ran fed batch perfusion reactors with the mass system hooked up to both um, the actual reactor itself as well as the perfusate for the perfusion studies. We've also incorporated, of course, online dielectric spectroscopy tools, um, the mass system, and then the Jubal software to actually aggregate and then visualize our data in real time. A little more in-depth slide here and picture really highlights some of the technologies we have which are accessible for our clients from, to in order to optimize processes. We are running currently uh, four broadly James reactors at two liters. We also have a three liter reactor in our shop as well. For perfusion, we're running refined ATF systems on our reactors. We have, of course, incubators for shake blast studies and cell propagation. We have a very flexible and agile lab environments. We've been incorporating FlexNova, the Gilson fraction collector that Clint alluded to earlier in order to collect real-time samples for glycoform analysis, uh, chromatography, amino acids, um, and as well as we can also perform cell-based assays with our plus optometry center here at Bend. Next part of the discussion will be around an incorporation of mass analytical, which Clint's already highlighted to an extent, but we'll touch on here as far as our demonstration lab is concerned. We are running a mass system here in our lab to in order to, in order to generate high density data around our bioreactors. And of course, as Clint mentioned, this is a modular system. It's self-sanitizing, it's autoclavable, it's integratable, it's, mo it's agile. What we have here currently is we have our perfusate and batch systems hooked up to a Nova as well as a Gilson in order to get real-time metabolic parameters analyzed of our cell culture. We can also then take fractions uh, and time slices out of our bioreactors and analyze those fractions and looking at glycoforms and amino acids offline. We're in the process of discussing uh, incorporating mass into an LC system to do real-time analysis of that as well, but that's in the works. This slide you've all seen before now. Um, this is what we have here at Bend, which is essentially we have an SP200 on our bioreactors. We also have the SP100 on our 3-liter reactor. And shown there in the middle is the sample navigator, which then shuttles samples to the Gilson. We are also alpha testing the automated solar removal device in the bottom of that slide currently in order to generate samples for LC analysis that are cell-free. We are running the FlexNova. Uh, we have mass spec for looking at real-time glycoforms and, of course, LCs. What we're thinking about here at Bend around uh, process, op process optimization and using mass is really getting away from the traditional process of bioreactor sampling, which is um, maybe once or twice a day generating samples off of a bioreactor during, say, a 14-day fed batch run, and then doing retrospective analysis of the samples taken out of those bioreactors. What we're proposing here at Bend, what we're doing here at Bend, is really what we're calling a data-enhanced process, where we generate multiple samples in a day, upwards of four or five samples, maybe more than that if needed, we're then integrating that mass into online PAT, such as the FlexNova, and then what we're doing is actually real-time analysis of our cell state using the metabolic parameters generated out of, out of that FlexNova. In order to make our lives easier, we've actually developed a software-based client experiment and data management tool we call Jubal. With Jubal, we're actually managing client, uh, and client data we're actually managing protocols, and we're curating data for downstream modeling 
and maybe most importantly, or, or maybe not most importantly, perhaps for our lab scientists, what's important is the data visualization aspect of the Jubal software system. This is the home screen of the Jubal software system. What you see here is actually what, um, how we plug in data. And you can see here, actually, SAFC is our development partner for this laboratory. Uh, we've been working with them for years in their cell lines, their show cell lines, and producing some data sets for exhibition over the past year. Using the Jubal software, we can actually look at data sources and visualize data in real time. So we actually can, can select data sources that have had data put into them from, into our Django servers, such as CDEX, Nova. We can then visualize that data looking at CDEX, Nova, uh, capacitance data, or metabolites in real time. We can either look at it in a tabular format that's shown at the bottom of the screen, or we can look at it graphically. So this slide has what we can actually see in real time, which is the graphical interface for the Jubal software suite, where to visualize data in real time. What you're seeing here is capacitance data shown in red, or ammonium concentration shown in green, and then date and inoculation. This is a perfusion run we actually ran over the course of 95 days. We're showing the first 65 days here. You can also see using the Jubal software the feeding, the day that the uh, cells were fed, perhaps or had an inoculation of some sort. In this case, perhaps as galactose concentrations were increased or modulated. So that's a, a handy aspect of Jubal where we can actually look at critical parameters of our cell metabolites in real time. This is a quick case study we threw together. It's sort of an appetizer for a future webinar that David Lyon mentioned earlier. This case study was around CHO cell growth inhibition that we're observing in our labs. And we identified the problem being CO2 concentrations, which was actually directly correlated to cell concentrations. So the problem statement was around cell growth inhibition by CO2 depletion. In real time, we were looking at our cell numbers crashing. And we were also monitoring CO2 data. They realized there was a correlation. And the solution we identified using Jubal and conversations in the lab with our scientists was to boost CO2 levels. To do that, we actually increase our initial seeding density, T0, our, inoc our inoculation concentration. This was the screenshot we were seeing early on, the solid green line. This is NOVA viable cell densities of function day since inoculation. The solid green line is our, was our good control, our comparator. What we were seeing, as shown in the bottom of this graph, the dotted lines, was a bad control, or these are the bad runs. And we actually realized that if we had a low inoculation seed density, we actually then saw a low growth rate performance. And we were saying low seed density wasn't significantly lower or really obviously lower than the good control runs, but it was enough to make a difference. And we ended up increasing our seed density from our, for our cells and saw real-time um, survival cell density increases that were more comparable to our good runs than the bad runs. This is, so the, the summary here in this slide is really that we identified pretty fast that depletion of CO2 drastically affected our cell culture performance. And as a result of pH control, we, did, we needed acidifying action. <clears throat> it was essentially a mass transfer issue. And we identified that we needed more cells. The next part of this lab infrastructure and methodology we're proposing here is really around the uh, reduction of data and the application of data. So this is model development and process optimization. As Dave was mentioning earlier, we do have another webinar planned. Uh, Brandon, and I, Brandon Downey and I have been on the road discussing this data set for the past few months. We will dive in more depth um, around this topic of data reduction and application for process optimization our next webinar. And in that webinar, we'll actually be discussing a methodology, a data-driven methodology, where it's actually a flow around initial system definition, measuring system dynamics, quantifying behavior in the bioreactor, developing predictive models, and applying those models to optimize process uh, performance. And the capabilities that we would really highlight with actual technologies we have here at Benda to actually enable these these um, process areas is really around tech transfer, scale down experiments, mine, mining existing data, using MAST, uh, handling and curating data very quickly using Jubal and our Django servers, of course, 
and then model development, validation, and subsequently application through process optimization. At this point, I want to thank you for attending and listening to our webinar, and we will be happy to host some questions. So thank you, uh, Clinton Jeff, uh, for that webinar and talk. And uh, we do have a few questions that have come in, and please feel free to continue to submit your questions using the uh, dialog box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, <clears throat> first question that we have today um, that's come across uh, speaks to what uh, Jeff was just talking about and asks, how does your Jubal software and server connect analytical results to the sample ID, and how is this managed? Yeah, that's a great question. So early on during experimental development and design, we actually um, assign our clients in the experiment itself a time identification code, which is then carried through all the way through the data sets and actually then um, is a way of tagging our data for an experiment to actually then make sure we are seeing the data in real time that, we're, that correlates back to the experiment and the client's interest. Good, good. So um, next question up is going to go to Clint. And the question asks, how many autoclave cycles can an SP200 take, and how many sampling sequences or cycles before the internal parts need to be rebuilt or replaced? That's a good question. The, the SP200, uh, we, we have done some robust testing, and we have shown that we can do up to 20 autoclavings per, uh, before uh, systems start to uh, have issues internally. Um, and the unit is designed to basically be replaceable on an annual basis. Uh, so that's with the cell culture. That's more than enough autoclavings. We'll, we'll continue to uh, do robust testing, but right now we're very confident that 20 autoclavings uh, you can handle that many. Thank you, Clint. So I have also a uh, question around the mass system, uh, which we'll ask Clint to reply to: Is uh, what is the success rate for your contamination history for use of the SP200 and SP100 valves? Good question. Good question. In the in our client use in here, uh, with uh, thousands of samples collected, we've had one contamination, which we found the root cause of, which was a uh, an older design of one of the valves, and we already had corrected that design. So we had one contamination in about two to three thousand samples. Excellent. Thank you, Clint. Um, another question's come in, and, and this is going to be back to, to Jeff discussing the integrated lab. And the question is, is what analytical tools are we able to use in the lab to generate data? So yeah, I guess that's a good question. It, it, I guess it assumes if you uh, are interested in on an integrated PAT versus simply just tools in general. Uh, we currently have in our lab hooked up the Flex Nova and a Gilson. So for for mass perspective, those are the two analytical tools we're using. Now, when looking into understanding a process or cell performance or antibody quality or protein quality. We're also bringing to bear things such as amino acid analysis, which is critically important for model, develop, model development. We're also looking at glycoforms. Um, a case study that we'll actually be hiding in the next webinar is around galactosylation. So we're doing an in-depth analysis of how galactose and cell state impacts galactosylation. So that's a lot of mass spec work here at Ben. Um, and we also have a Flex Nova, I'm sorry, not Flex Nova, a Fax Aria, focus autometry analysis. We can also have a BSL, we also have a BSL2 facility here at Ben Research. that actually can do cell-based screening and cell-based assays to look at protein activity as a function of expression, if that's of interest to the clients. We also can map Western blocks, STS pages, um, any number of molecular biology tools to bring to bear to uh, bring the right data stream into solving a problem. Good. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, back to a question around um, the mast. This is uh, focused on the cell removal system, Clinton. The question asks, what mechanism does the cell removal system use to create a cell-free solution? Good question. Uh, this, uh, this is a beta prototype system. It utilizes a hollow fiber uh, technology where the sample is introduced into the system and then pushed back and forth across the hollow fibers, concentrating the whole broth and supernatant coming out on the permeate side, which then can be pushed to the next uh, analytical device or to the Gilson. 
the key to this is that after every sample, we do a cleaning and a, and a, and a normalization process to return the membrane back to its original state. And we feel that uh, with some of the experience we've seen that you can, we can do many, many samples, maybe 20 to 30 samples before we need to replace the, uh, the cartridge. Excellent. Yeah, so the follow-on question to that just came in, and that is, um, are there scale limitations in, uh, with the mass systems? I presume that they are asking about what size reactors can we utilize this, the, uh, the uh, SP100 or 200 on? We, we currently use the either SP100 or 200 of scales from 1 liter up to 2,000 liters. Uh, the nice thing is that it, it pulls a consistent sample in a similar way from no matter what reactor size. Uh, the, the SP200 is limited in that it pulls 5 mil sample increments, and so once you get below a 1 liter reactor, if you want to take, like Jeff was talking about, more, more than one sample a day, you start to become uh, limited in volume. Uh, so right now it really is from 1 liter up to you know, as big as you want. Good. Thank you. And, and Jeff, another question came in about the lab. Um, and the question is, is uh, how frequently are we generating samples using mass, and then how are we using those kinds of data? Yeah, that's a great question. The neat thing about mass is we can actually um, modulate the frequency of sampling out of our bioreactors. So we are looking currently, our we have an R&D program around cell dynamics and responses to perturbations, in this case, the lactose. And we've been taking four to five samples across a 24-hour period to make sure we quantify the dynamic responses of those cells as a function of perturbation or in this case, addition of galactose, which makes it um, pretty easy that we're nice. The nice aspect of that is we actually can produce uh, very robust models using the high-density data sets during the dynamic periods of cell responses. After those um, responses sort of subside, we're in steady state mode, we usually take one or two samples per day. So because it's an automated sampling device, MASH really enables us to take um, different sampling frequencies pretty easily, depending upon our experimental design, which gets back to how we design our, our model at the same time that we're trying to get out of the experiment. Yeah, good. And this follow-on question probably can either go to uh, Clint or Jeff, um, following on the question of what analytical tools we're using in the integrated lab. And, and the question is, is, can the analyzer, presumably the mass system, be adjusted to uh, take samples from the Bicell XR cell counter or the CDEX biometabolite analyzer? So we are working with uh, Bicell currently to develop that program and also with Roche, the, the BioHD. Those programs are in their early phases, but uh, we have, uh, talking with their engineers, we're confident that it's definitely doable. There's definitely a established communication protocol, and we, uh, we've already determined the, the physical uh, strategy for supplying the staff to the device. Good. And we have one more question, and then we'll uh, call it a wrap for the day for this webinar. And that is, um, can our software communicate data out to an industrial control system, presumably Delta V in this case? Yeah, we're actually getting there towards integrating Jubal with, probably with, uh, with Delta V. We are using Delta V in our labs right now currently for uh, controlling our bioreactors. And so we are in discussion right now with our IT team, our bioinformatics team, towards integration of Delta V into Jubal. For that, we've had that question posted I think, a few times, and now we know that's, an, that's a hot topic, so we are looking into that. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention and attending our webinar today. As I said at the beginning of the webinar, we will have a follow-on uh, discussion, presumably in a month or two, but please follow our website and look for our announcements. Um, and we will uh, uh, look forward to connecting with you then. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's conference. You'll be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. And the survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us improve our further webinars. Now. Please join us in thanking our speakers for today, Clint Pepper and Jeffrey Bright, and our moderator for today, David Lyon. We hope that you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.